Time now for the Sunday Talk. Tonight, the politics of assisted dying. Canadians were caught by surprise this week by new government recommendations on assisted dying that go further than many expected, extending the option of assisted dying to dementia patients, people with psychiatric conditions, and eventually even to some children. My body is literally caving in, caving in to allow me the right to die with dignity. In 2012, Gloria Taylor was fighting both ALS and for her right to a doctor-assisted death. At the BC level, she won. Oh, thank you, God. The judge ruled a ban on assisted death violated the charter. Last year, the country's top court upheld the decision and gave Parliament a year to rewrite the law. This is an existential, moral issue that affects everyone that is alive today. A majority of Canadians support assisted dying. The latest poll says 85% agree with the Supreme Court. But will they agree with all the latest recommendations? This committee wrestled on every issue. Among them, advanced consent so a patient diagnosed with dementia can agree now to have a doctor end their life later. Also, extending doctor-assisted death to the mentally ill and eventually to minors. But not everyone on the committee agreed. The most glaring example of this is that there are virtually no safeguards in place for persons with underlying mental health uh, challenges. It's uh, too early to uh, say what is going to be in the legislation. The High Court has given the new Liberal government until June to create new legislation. I'm joined by our panelists. Tasha Carradine is a columnist with the National Post and iPolitics. John Moore is a talk radio host in Toronto. And Supriya Devetti is a political commentator and consultant at Crestview Strategy. So, John, I'll start with you on this. Uh, the new recommendations, we've discussed assisted uh, dying before, but the new recommendations, do they go too far? This is probably going to come as a big surprise to people who've heard me debating the issue for a long time. But yes, I actually do believe it goes too far. Um, the term that has been used in the last week, and I know here at the CBC now we're saying assisted dying, but what we've been saying in the coverage is assisted suicide. And I think it's a really important distinction. Assisted dying means basically accelerating a death that is already going to happen. So somebody who is already terminally ill, who wants to make an early exit, can do so. And if they're physically incapable of doing it themselves, then they can get some help from a willing doctor. But I think, and we'll get into this more deeply, here we are talking about suicide. We're creating a pretext for the state to assist you in killing yourself when, and it sounds very brutish, you may be in a position to do it yourself. What do you think, Supriya? I actually disagree. I don't think it goes too far. And I think, you know, when we're starting from legislation from the ground up, we need situations to be as comprehensive as possible. You don't want to find yourself in a legal vacuum later down the line. Uh, just because they, you know, they're foreseeing all these situations doesn't mean that they will be necessarily in enforced unanimously. That doesn't mean that somebody who has dementia can, you know, they're not going to be forced into assisted dying down the line. It just gives people the option that would like to engage in that, to go ahead and do so. And I think ultimately it comes down to uh, a decision between yourself and your doctor, and nobody else really has a right to tell you, um, what, you know, when to end your life. Progress or going too far? I think in some cases it's going too far, others it's progress. Uh, with regard to dementia, I would agree if when someone has um, a lucid mind, if they are in a situation where they are able to give consent, that they should be able to give a pre-consent um, to a situation where they would no longer have that lucidity. But I have a problem with giving the right to children. I think we agree as a society children cannot consent to a variety of things. To say that they can consent to end their life, to me, is a very slippery slope. And I also, with mental health issues, I think conditions that are reversible, where people may simply not be taking medication at a certain point, we all hear about that. I, I wanted to kill myself and then somebody stopped me from doing it and I was happy they did. People at low points in their lives, I think that's dangerous. So much to talk about here, but let's deal with the, the first issue that you raised, which is say someone uh, saying, if I reach the stage of Alzheimer's, for mm -hmm. example, uh, I will no longer want to live. Um, what if they change their mind? Sure, but and, I mean, and what, they don't, and they can't express that. Like, how do you right, know? Right, right. I mean, and, and that's a very good point. But we allow for, you know, advanced consent or whatever you want to call it for a multitude of other mm -hmm. areas. So whether that's signing a, a do not resuscitate order, um, whether that's signing, you know, uh, if you want the, the the plug pulled if you're in a certain vegetative state, or whether that's signing over your power of attorney. So those questions loom large for a bunch of uh, other issues. And and I do agree that does become problematic. But you, you know, that's kind of the the, the risk that you're undertaking. Um, when you give that sort of advanced consent. 
Yeah, but I look at it, for example, I think the reason we would have assisted suicide is for people who cannot do it for themselves. So ALS right. is, is one of the classic cases where somebody is actually still of lucid mind, mm -hmm. but they no longer have the physical capability. I would like for somebody to be able to give their consent at the time of the assisted death. And I really do worry about dementia, uh, that, you know, you may say this is the standard by which I do not wish to live anymore, but how, if you can't express that when you get to that point, that's, that's an extremely scary situation. But when you're at that point, the whole purpose, the whole reason is because you would not be able to, because you do, you become in a state where you cannot give consent anymore. And I think that um, as a person who's had a family member, my father had dementia towards the end of his life, and he wasn't at the point where he absolutely didn't know everything that was going on, but that was coming. He passed away from other things. I would never want to be in a state where I was that. I would, I would sign up for that one because I think that as a conscious person, I would be able to give that consent when I could as opposed to when I was no longer able to. I guess my worry is that in your decline, and we will never know, that in the decline of a person, their um, you know, demarcation of what it is after which I cannot possibly want to live, that that may change after you are no longer able to communicate. Well, you will never know because you would. Uh, yeah. That is that's, true. That's you, why you it's would a not know. Reason. I know yeah. you would not know. But at the same time, I think that um, if you see it in others and you say, "I do not want to be that," you can make that judgment as a sane person, as opposed to, like I said, a child who doesn't have that judgment. The other argument that's made here so often is that family of the of the elderly who see the suffering or are suffering themselves from the level of care that they have to provide, that there's this fear that that family members may move more quickly than is appropriate. Like, how, well, how do you answer that? Mm. Okay, well, that's why we have doctors in place. That's why the, the decision isn't just solely up to the family member, solely up to the person. You need a, a willing physician, um, and in some cases, two independent physicians, to be able to, to make that decision. And, and if we're saying that we don't trust our physicians to be able to, you, you know, decide on matters of life and death, then we have a, probably a bigger problem on our hands. The other issue that you raise, or one of the other ones, is minors. Mm -hmm. uh, so this would be phase two. It wouldn't happen for a number of years. But the idea that the children, uh, say someone 12 years old, uh, should be able to say, I'm in so much pain. You have a problem with that. I have a problem. Um, I have a problem basically because I think, even though there have been cases of children in Europe who have done this, um, I think most children, children are also influenceable. And I think of the Latimer case, Robert Latimer, who mm -hmm. did go to jail, said it was a mercy killing. His daughter could not was communicate. With cerebral palsy, yeah. Exactly. Um, but there are cases where children, for example, could communicate through spell boards or other things. Could that be manipulated by caregivers who are at the end of their rope to say, my child wants to kill themselves? I have a real difficulty with children who could be influenced by older people. John? Yeah, again, for me, it comes down to, it, it would be a case-by-case -case basis. And certainly, I've done a lot of fundraising with the hospital for sick kids, and I've walked along the journey of a lot of kids who are terminally ill. And I think that's important. Robert Latimer's daughter was not terminally exactly. ill. Exactly. Uh, who are terminally ill, and they are mature beyond their years. They understand their bodies. They understand medicine. They know that they're going to die. And if you could relieve that suffering by two weeks at the, the, the permission of the child in consultation with their parents, and no parent's going to want to accelerate age, the child's John. death. Mm -hmm. I know, that, that's, that's a growing issue, but I, I still think it's sort of one of those things you'll know it when you see it. And honestly, I have talked to eight-year-olds who are dying, who understand the whole process and, and understand the prick of the needle. They understand everything. You know, and I think it's good that it's problematic. It obviously should be problematic. If we were all sitting here and we were like, yeah, we're okay with children making decisions about life and death for themselves, we'd be, again, in a, in a, in a bigger problematic situation. Uh, but I think, as John pointed out, you know, these kids are tragically mature beyond their years. Um, and and I, I think, you know, I, again, to my, to my original point, you don't want a legal vacuum. So I think by, by putting a blanket no on the situation would be bad. And, and you want to be able to, again, leave that decision up to the child and their physicians. The, the other, the third, perhaps really contentious area here is uh, people with psychological problems, people mm -hmm. who are depressed and just say, I would like some help. Life is unbearable. Are, <laughs> Again, I have a problem with that one, definitely. Tasha mm -hmm. and I keep on, it's funny, we go <laughs> to opposite sides of the fence on some of these things. But when I look at Europe, especially in Denmark, the experience has been that there seems to be a belief there that um, people are completely autonomous and that the state should help them accomplish certain things. And when it comes to somebody saying, I'm depressed, I'd like to die, mm -hmm. well, that's okay, here you go, you get to die. Uh, I would find that extraordinarily worrisome because as long as you have something, if you're not actively dying, if you mm -hmm. have something treatable, that there are options, then we should go for the options. Yeah, there was a case recently of an autistic man who got the state to kill him, to, uh, to assist him with his suicide, because he felt his autism was unbearable. And that, to me, is very frightening. I think there are cases where these are conditions that are not, like you said, they're not life-threatening. Um, people can live with them, and they can, in some cases, also for mental illness, take medications. But could those now be painted as, oh, if you have this, 
maybe you should consider this. I mean, it is a slippery slope when it you think about that. It is such a fundamental issue of being able to decide for yourself what is right and how, how do we ever really, how do outsiders ever really know? It's, I mean, that's a great question. That's the million dollar question right there. And, and, and I think, you know, ultimately it needs to, that's why we, we make it so that's between the physician and the person. Um, but I do agree with, with both John and Tasha here that, you know, once you're talking about mental illness and, and things that are treatable, that then you become into a terrible slippery slope situation that I don't think anybody wants to go down. So originally the Supreme Court said one year. Mm -hmm. uh, that was extended for four months. So now, Tasha, it's, the deadline is June. Yes. Is that enough time for something this fundamental? Well, while I agree with you, it's it's in some ways good, Supriya, to have, um, you know, to have a, a legal framework and to say mm -hmm. we're going to, it's a very Cartesian approach. We're going to identify all the elements and we're going to make sure we cover all the bases. I would be more comfortable with a law that covered some bases well as opposed to all the bases poorly. I think they're trying to tackle too much in the time frame they have. I also think that this government is very anxious to have very dramatic accomplishments. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of a, an impetus in this government to kind of ram things down the throats of the people they defeated at the polls. You know, take that, uh, conservatives. So I worry, uh, between now and June, that's pretty fast. Yeah. Sure, but I mean, the, the, the between now and June wasn't set by, by the liberals themselves. The between now and June was set by, by, by the court. Right, but let's and get so, rid of that arbitrary Yeah, timeline. no, yeah. fair. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm optimistic, cautiously optimistic, I guess, that they'll be able to get it right before June. But it is definitely a time crunch. So there's been some discussion as to whether this will be a whipped vote, meaning will the, the government force all of the caucus members to, to do it. What do you, what do you think? I, I think, actually, this is one of those situations where people should absolutely be allowed to vote their conscience. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would be wise of the Liberal leader to allow for that. And I think it would pass. I mean, even yeah. some Conservatives. Mm -hmm. the, the problem are the lines that we've been talking about here. I think almost everybody agrees that somebody who's dying of cancer in the last two weeks of their life can make their own choices and a doctor can help them. I think it's the other gray zones that, uh, that you That's know... That's a quick, quick point. Yeah, yeah which is why I think covering that base well would be a smarter strategy. It would be more likely to pass the House without extremely contentious debate. And if we wanted to go further at later dates, that could be debated. Well, so much changed since the, the Latimer case. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So much change in this country in terms of... And Rodriguez. Of, well, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see where this one goes. Thanks so much to all of you. Thank you.